School of Nursing, and I'm also representing the um, Northwest GECs um, and uh, the steering committee. And um, a reminder again that we have an nwgec.org website where this lecture will be posted for free uh, access with just registration um, requested when the lecture series is over. So today we are very lucky to have Eric Jansen here to talk about Fearless in Pink, Aging in the LGBT Community. Um, Eric is a family nurse practitioner with a doctorate in nursing practice, one of those new DNP degrees. Um, he has a national certification as an ARNP in family practice since September 2012. And as a DNP prepared family nurse practitioner, he brings additional skills and training in advanced practice, appraising and translating evidence into practice, leadership such as organizational system, system strengthening, policy development, and working with diverse populations. All pretty important in addressing this topic. At his present position at Virginia Mason Medical Center, he utilizes lean thinking to improve health outcomes for patients. He has significant experience working with patients from communities of color, uninsured immigrants and refugees, low income, and the LGBT community. So welcome, Eric. Thanks Thank you. for coming. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to start today by doing um, kind of a little, little history just to kind of do some touch points and put things a little bit more in context for um, the community. So LGBT standing for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. Um, sometimes you'll see some other letters thrown on there, and it can just be a little bit more specific to each community. And we'll talk a little bit about um, language that might be appropriate for elders. And I'm focusing um, for that definition to be those 65 and older. Um, so one of the landmark events in the U.S. Um, was the Stonewall Rebellions, which happened in the summer of 1969 in New York City. Um, and this is a kind of photo from that, that time where uh, there's a lot of harassment that uh, LGBT folks experienced um, by going into what was their way to have community at that time, which was mainly around the bar scene. Um, and people were often uh, hauled out by police during raids. Um, their names put in the paper. They were arrested, humiliated publicly, and then the charges would be dropped the next day. Um, often people would, this would result in them losing their jobs, um, being shamed you know, publicly by um, the situation with friends and family. Um, and so the reason that the, the rebellion, the Stonewall rebellions happened was because folks were sick and tired of being treated this way. And so over about two or three nights one summer, uh, they fought back. And this is seen as sort of the landmark event to launch the gay rights, uh, gay civil rights movement. And that's, uh, you might have heard of gay pride that's celebrated every year in June because of that reason. Um, here's another iconic uh, symbol from uh, the LGBT community uh, focused more on HIV AIDS and the activism that came around that period of time when um, HIV was very new in 1981. Um, and throughout the 80s to early 90s, a group called ACT UP did a lot of um, civil disobedience to bring awareness to HIV and how it was specifically affecting um, gay and bisexual men more than any other community um, in the US and then uh, later abroad. And so we have um, a lot of probably progress that happened in HIV AIDS um, because of that movement. So you might often see the symbol affiliated with a gay community. It's also a symbol that can be used in offices, um, uh, long-term care facilities, uh, as kind of showing that there's an awareness around LGBT issues and that this might be a more friendly and affirming place for folks to go. Um, so today, some of the objectives that we'll cover are being able to have a better understanding of the demographics uh, for this community of elders, um, focus on the historical and present day uh, context that shapes the lives, lives of these elders, uh, different approaches um, and maybe methodologies to offer an environment that's more affirmative uh, and welcoming of LGBT folks in a healthcare setting. Um, and 
having you be able to describe some of the unique challenges or barriers within healthcare um, or health status for LGBT individuals. Um, so, how many uh, folks can, can, can just reflect on this? Um, if you've had training prior to um, coming to school or in school regarding LGBT issues, um, and then to think about why might LGBT health be specifically relevant to your type of practice, whether um, you're a nurse practitioner, you're a physician, a PA, um, PTOT, um, an administrator, uh, either in a hospital, long-term care setting, um, jails. Jails is actually a, a really relevant topic to LGBT health, and we can talk about that a little bit more later. So, you know, for, for myself personally, um, there, I think, was maybe one class where I was trained during my nursing career, uh, or during my nursing training, that uh, had some LGBT content. Um, and so there was a little bit more awareness raising that needed to be done. But a lot of folks don't have this in their training. Um, interestingly, med schools happen to be a little bit more ahead of the game than, than nursing schools um, in terms of content um, and having a little bit more awareness. But I think that that's, that's obviously changing. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of flesh out more about how it's relevant to practice. Um, so one good reason is that uh, LGBT people are in every community, and some of us might intuitively know this, um, but this was actually able to be quantified for the first time in the 2010 census, uh, where it was first asked uh, if people were in same-sex relationships with, living within a home together. So that captured um, at least people who were coupled and living together for the 2010 census. So what it didn't capture is people who uh, might identify as LGB uh, or T, but not necessarily be living in um, a same-sex relationship. And they captured it in every single zip code except for one zip code somewhere in the Midwest that I'm not recalling. But um, people were very open about their answers. So I think um, you know, one of the other things that we'll talk about is that there's a dearth of research uh, specific to LGBT health issues, and most, most of it is focused on gay and bi men's health related to sexually transmitted infections and HIV. So it's disproportionately skewed towards that. And in terms of overall health status, we don't have a lot of information. Um, LGBT people might not be willing to disclose their health, uh, or excuse me, their sexual orientation or gender identity within a health encounter um, because of some historical reasons, obviously, for mistreatment, but some pretty specific mistreatment within the healthcare system. Um, and just fear of what that might be, even if they might be in a setting that is prepared to, to welcome them and, and um, accept them for who they are. Um, and sort of because of these things, folks uh, who identify as LGBT, um, especially elders, might less, be less likely to fill a prescription that you write if you are a prescriber. Um, they are less likely to follow a treatment plan. Um, and they're more likely to access their health care much later in the course of a disease or illness when they might be more sick. And so, you know, their course of illness might be in a, a more severe situation at that point. And certainly the cost to the overall health care system is going to increase if we have to do more intense interventions or they're ending up in the emergency department. Um, and providers um, can play a role. Pharmacists can play a role. Even folks working in long-term care settings can play a role in things like making sure folks are getting the screenings that they need um, for you know, preventing things like cervical cancer, for example. Um, and there's a, a fair number of health disparities that are experienced by LGBT persons because of lack of screenings, for example. Uh, so here's just a little brain teaser for you. What is the strongest predictor of poor LGBT elder health outcomes? So A, smoking history, B, HIV infection, C, colon cancer, D, victimization, or E, lung cancer. Uh, anybody who's here want to venture a guess? Um, so the correct answer is D, victimization. Um, some data that uh, was most recently done, and I think it's actually the only funding though, thus far 
that's received um, a large NIH grant uh, was to Dr. Fredrickson Golden, who's actually a University of Washington School of Social Work researcher, and she's done extensive um, data collection and analysis specific to LGBT elders. And some of her research from 2012 found that uh, LGBT elders have been victimized at least once, 82% um, of them have, and those who have been victimized at least three times have been as high as 64%. Um, so that includes things like harassment, physical violence, emotional violence, um, et cetera. Hate crimes um, being, you know, called hateful names on the street or actually being attacked. 21% um, reported having been fired from a job specifically because they were LGB or T or expected or suspected to be LGB or T. 41% of LGBT elders have a disability. Um, I was trying to find some data that compared this to the general population, and I couldn't find any really great statistics. Um, but uh, Dr. Fredrickson Golden's uh, estimates look like they're probably higher than the general population. 13% um, have been denied health care or have suffered inferior uh, health care services. 21% do not disclose their sexual orientation or transgender identity to their physician, and the question was specifically asked about physicians, not other healthcare providers or other folks who might interact with um, these elders in a healthcare setting. Um, and 30% do not have a will, 36% do not have durable power of attorney. Um, so some more background that, that can perhaps put this into context is uh, even if folks have come out of the closet, and when I say that, I mean basically folks who have decided that they identify as either gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, and they're out to you know, a significant portion of people in their lives, friends, family, maybe even workplace. Um, and when this happens, um, th so far some data has shown that um, a lot of folks who are over 65 are being rejected from um, family, their kids. They might have been married to an opposite sex spouse at one point and then come out at a later point in time. Um, rejection from um, communities of faith, um, losing jobs. Um, and so folks can be either single or without children. There hasn't been really one um, way or the other. Um, and most have lived at least part of their lives out of the closet. Um, they've experienced the denial of human, human and civil rights, and all at risk uh, are at risk for um, discrimination when accessing health services because it's always a risk to find that next person to come out to. Um, I think another part of this to remember is that there's not just one sort of coming out experience. It's constant. It's always happening. It's omnipresent. Um, you constantly are meeting new folks. You might, you know, end up in an emergency department, or you, there might be somebody new at work, new boss, new supervisee, supervisor. So it's this sort of constant analysis, and and I would say, you know, maybe not very quantifiable, but the stress of always trying to tread those waters and decide, am I going to do this? What risks am I going to take? How vulnerable am I going to be because of this? Um, so case study, and this is taken from the Fenway Institute, um, changed it up a little bit, but some similar um, ideas. And the Fenway Institute is out of um, Boston, and they have a healthcare center that is LGBT specific for health services, but they also have sort of a research and education institute. And uh, I think this is a fantastic resource. They have a lot of modules online that you can access for free. They have um, video conferencing that they do every couple of months. They'll have a speaker with a certain topic. Um, and you can go back into the archives and look at some of the uh, older um, videos that they have there. And it's all available for free. And they uh, have also some of the latest data that is accessible for free. Uh, so we're going to look at Vincent, who's 69 years old, new to your practice today. Um, He's accompanied by a friend who lives with him and ends up doing kind of more of the talking for him. Um, he's coming in today with anxiety, pain, um, poor concentration, some sexual dysfunction. 
um, pertinent medical history, depression, anxiety, uh, chronic pain issues, hypertension, GERD, and some substance use with alcohol. Um, he's retired, never married, no children, and again, lives with a friend who he's here with today. Um, so think about some of the things that you would want to know more about his situation um, being new to your practice. Um, and this type of encounter can be pretty typical for an LGBT um, older adult. Um, they might not want to share very much with you, um, kind of just not be very willing to give information. And so kind of thinking about what are the, the major tasks to get done with that visit today. Um, and, and how would you best strategize that, knowing that there's possibly, you know, this um, question of this friend might actually be his partner, um, and maybe that's something that you're thinking about in the back of your mind, and how would you best create a space for him or them to talk about that? Um, and how has sort of the history of being in the closet or expecting to be in the closet um, brought him to where he is today, and how can we prevent him to feel like he has to stay in the closet or go back in the closet? So best thing, um, best thing that you can do is to create a space where you're giving him time to talk and be open to listen um, and build trust. Uh, so probably a lot of us have known that open-ended questions are a great way to obviously approach this um, and to find ways maybe to just flat out ask. I'm getting the sense that you two are together as a couple. Is, am I, is that accurate? Or help me understand your relationship a little bit better. Um, saying things like that. And if, if you're wrong, I've, I've actually been wrong. But I, I think that it's been OK to ask. So as an example, um, when I was doing an orthopedic rotation in a clinic that I was only there for about four weeks, um, I had these two women who were in their mid to late 70s. And one was there getting ready for a knee replacement surgery. And um, I, I thought that I had some cues that maybe they were a couple. And I asked them. And in fact, they were not a couple. But they actually did both identify as lesbians. Neither one of them had partners. They were just really good friends. They didn't have any kids. And they were each other's support system. So I think that that's another thing to pay attention to about who are the important people in folks' lives and who's getting support. And it's important to be able to make sure that they're included in that care. Um, so to highlight some health concerns for gay and bi men, um, anal cancer might be uh, higher prevalence for gay men who are HIV positive. And as we're seeing more HIV positive folks live longer, um, they might start to develop other types of illnesses um, than if they you know, had, had perhaps died sooner before the antiretrovirals were available starting in the mid-90s. Um, we're seeing a lot of elders with HIV. Um, no conclusive data, but some thought that perhaps lung cancer rates might be, uh, there might be higher risk of having higher rates with gay and bisexual men um, because there's historically higher rates of smoking. And this is another area that there's actually been some really good research done. There's really strong data. Um, both lesbians, bisexual women, gay men, and bisexual men um, have disproportionately higher rates of tobacco use compared to the general population. Uh, so for example, I think some data for the state of Washington is probably about two years old, uh, two or three years old. Uh, general population had a smoking rate that was about 15 to 16 percent, and gained by men are as high as 40 percent. Um, there's been some specific work in local communities that have tried to target that to bring that down. Um, and a lot of that is considered for two reasons. One, the main place of focus for the community has historically been the bar. Um, that's been the safer place to go and meet people. It's where you can go after work. And if you're not out at work or another home, you can be out at the bar. And uh, you know, until very recently, smoking was permitted and often <laughs> encouraged in bars and really goes hand in hand with alcohol use, as we know. And so the other specific reason, though, is that actually tobacco companies have specifically targeted the LGBT community. Um, and at first, this was specifically in things like gay pride events. So 
A lot of other corporations didn't want anything to do with the gay community, wouldn't provide sponsors for kind of these big community events, and tobacco and alcohol are actually the two that have been right on board from the very beginning. So there's been some very specific um, and deliberate work done by Big Tobacco to target this community. Um, touch a little bit on other drugs. So meth is a big problem for a lot of gay and bisexual men. Um, it's kind of gone uh, hand in hand with perhaps inappropriate use of things like Cialis and Viagra, um, of this sort of cycle of staying up and partying. Um, I, there's not a lot of great data for communities of folks over 65. Um, but, you know, that's definitely a problem in the, the 20s, 30s, 40s, and uh, overlaps a little bit to older. Um, and so kind of the cycle of how meth plays uh, a risk factor for acquiring HIV and other STIs um, and just makes people at risk for other health problems. So something else to kind of keep in mind. Um, some info on disparities, and this comes from Healthy People 2020. Um, folks from the LGBT community are disproportionately uninsured. Um, kind of curious to see how this might change after the Affordable Care Act has been under our belts for a few years. Um, there are also increasing numbers of uh, companies and organizations that employ people that offer same-sex benefits. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, there comes to be a little bit of conflict sometimes with, with folks who have transgender identities. Um, and might be trying to get benefits um, from their partner. So uh, it's sort of also a big question on whether or not trans people's marriages are legal and then get afforded the same rights as um, non-transgendered folks, even with some things that are changing in states based on same-sex marriage. So it's, it's kind of a big question mark in some ways that that can play out if there's a, let's say for example, a transgendered woman, so meaning born male has transitioned to female, who might be married to a man who is biologically male um, and they are not married or perhaps can't get married, question mark, we don't know. If that man has benefits, even that include same-sex benefits at his place of employment, trans people are still rejected from that. They're like, well, you're, you're a straight couple. You can just get married and you can get your benefits that way. And so often this is the, the problem that, that folks run up against. And then if they want to address that problem, it actually forces that couple to come out. Maybe they don't want to. It, faces, it forces that transgender individual to be outed as transgender who might not want to do that. Um, talk a little bit about higher rates of smoking. Um, also really high rates of depression, stress, anxiety. Um, so that came up in, in Vincent's visit, and a lot of that is thought to be because of the, the harassment, the stress of just going about your day as an LGBT person. Um, disproportionately high substance use and abuse. Uh, talked already about the denial of partner and spousal benefits. Um, the lesbian and, and bi women are in there, I think more specifically, um, just because women make less and have you know, historically less access to um, as good paying jobs for the same work that men do. Um, and so two women who are partnered together trying to have the same economic, you know, benefit that maybe two men have, it doesn't, it doesn't even out, unfortunately, still. Um, and then disproportionately uh, face harassment and violence. And recently there have been some stories in the Seattle news about events happening on Capitol Hill, and for those who are watching or listening and don't live in that area, this is historically the, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans um, neighborhood of Seattle. And so even in a, a city that is seen to be a pretty progressive, open-minded, there's been laws here in place that protect folks. Um, there's an out community. There's many resources. Um, there's still people getting beaten in the street, getting harassed in the street. And so it doesn't just happen in the small town. It can happen anywhere. Um, there's, you know, the benefit of sometimes more resources in the town to in a larger town or city to it to address those things or giving space for people to come together, but um, it can happen anywhere. Um, so some some information around LGBT people of color um, who have 
sort of the unfair burden of dealing with racism, homophobia, transphobia um, from within their communities of color and within LGBT communities that are you know, historically dominated by um, white people and um, have to deal with the racism within those communities. So they might find acceptance for being LGBT within the LGBT community, but then are up against a wall of racism um, and maybe from their families of origin are obviously accepted for just being who they are based on race and ethnicity, um, but may not always be embraced for identifying as LGB or T or at least not openly being able to identify as such. Um, and a little bit sort of relevant to the nursing world is just historically um, it's, it's very white. It's, um, it's kind of the white Christian women's domain for decades and decades and decades. And so I think that we're kind of starting to see this be a little bit more of a turning point with more encouragement of um, folks of color to become, come into nursing um, and a, a little bit more discussion about LGBT identities within nursing as well. Um, some data that was taken from Lambda Legal, which is a, advoc a national advocacy organization uh, for LGBT rights. Um, and they often do a lot of case law work. Um, this is from 2009 data. And so what you can kind of gather from these charts here, let's see if we can, I'm not sure how well it's seen over here. So. Yeah, they can't see your pointer, but you just, can't. yeah. I just drag this, right. okay. So this side of the chart is all LGB people who are in the study. And this side of the chart, um, is LGBT, uh, or excuse me, are trans, uh, trans individuals, both people of color and white folks. And so basically the, the takeaway from this is your worst case scenario in accessing healthcare is if you are transgendered and a person of color. Um, it's, it's pretty bad in general if you're LGB, um, but if you're a trans person of color, in most cases you're more than uh, twice as likely to experience things like being refused health care, um, be treated with harsh language when you access health care, being refused to be touched for um, an exam or while accessing health care services, being blamed for your condition, and uh, physically being handled in a rough or an abusive manner. Um, and I, I, every time I look at this, I still it just, it, it, it just kind of shocks me that this is this recent in time and that this is still happening both from the LGBT perspective but also to face that as a person of color um, and how much more difficult it would be to even want to go and access health services um, if you felt like you could you could uh, approach them in your area just the risk of, of being treated so poorly. Um, so back in 2011, uh, there was a report done kind of like in a white paper kind of way called Injustice at Every Turn. And this was specifically looking at the experiences of transgendered people from a variety of um, perspectives, um, looking at the, the economics um, in terms of uh, poverty, employment, um, mental health issues, other health services issues. Um, and so at that time, more than um, transgender folks experienced more than four times the national poverty rate. Um, and so this is during the economic downturn that uh, transgender folks were more likely to, to suffer the economic burden of that recession. Um, transgender folks are twice as likely to be unemployed uh, so that not only affects whether or not maybe uh, you have health insurance, maybe not so much uh, now that we have the Affordable Care Act, um, but if you're, if you're not employed or you have to worry about having a job, you're probably more worried about things like how you're going to eat, how you're going to pay your rent, are you going to have a place to live, can you do your car payment. Um, and so those uh, you know, all play into whether or not you're going to find another job, whether or not you're going to access health services if that ends up becoming a priority. Um, more than 25% of transgender individuals reported being uh, fired from their job because of being trans. Um, and I have a patient that I'm working with 
currently who started into my practice just as she was let go from a job uh, that she had started uh, just a few months prior. Um, and the long and the short of it is, is that when they um, decided that her, uh, her, her trans identity says female on all, all of her legal papers, um, but she was previously known to them as an M. And so when she presented paperwork that had the F, they told her that she misrepresented herself and lied to the company. Um, and she was let go. Uh, and she's currently pursuing that um, with attorneys. But she didn't make a lot of money to begin with, couldn't find an attorney, um, didn't, you know, didn't think that that was something she could afford. And so being a healthcare provider, that's one thing that I feel that we are responsible to um, to our patients to put them in touch with these services. Uh, if you don't know them off the top of your head, um, it's something to, to become familiar with either in your local area or nationally. Um, Lambda Ligo, the one that had uh, a couple slides ago with the graph, that's one resource to help people kind of find attorneys in their local area that can do advocacy. And again, we're very lucky in, in the Seattle area, there are a lot of resources, including there's an LGBT law clinic at UW that helps um, helps folks, and there's a couple of other nonprofit resources in Seattle. Um, but this person actually lives in a, a rural area, not in Seattle, and needs to travel pretty far to even kind of um, to access that support. So, um, transgender African Americans have four times the unemployment rate um, as other transgender folks, even. Um, Forty-one percent have attempted suicide, and that's of all trans people. Um, and this was a pretty significant um, end. There were about three thousand people in this study, uh, probably one of the bigger studies that included transgender folks at all. Um, so that's that's pretty startling, and to me says that that's something that we need to really be screening for, and, and what's going on with the mental health um, of transgender folks, and, and perhaps particularly the the elders. Um, that might be isolated from their families of origin for for those reasons on you know on top of dealing with other issues that come up with aging. Um, and I think the, the the most startling and troublesome and horrifying statistic is that transgender African Americans have four times forty times the national HIV rate. Um, so when HIV is is uh, not really affecting the general population that much, and even in comparison to gain by men who have disproportionately had higher rates of HIV in the U.S. compared to the general population, um, transgender African Americans, specifically male to female, um, have the highest rates um, that even in some instances of uh, the U.S. Um, are in competition with Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is a quote from um, a Dibble et al. study in 2009 that, quote, LGBT people are one of the largest underserved populations both in the nursing setting and um, as patients and clients and staff members. Um, and so what this gets at is that a lot of folks who work in nursing actually are often asked to be closeted or kind of silenced um, about their identities um, and then are also possibly patients in the settings that they work at. Um, so I, I think we're seeing nursing kind of moving along and, and starting to address this more and more, which makes me very happy to see. But something else to just think about in the settings that, that you may work in. Um, some additional health concerns for elders who are gay and bi men. Um, and I you know a little bit I want to say about language in that. So. Um, sometimes we hear the term queer, um, gay, bi, and some people don't identify with those names or labels at all, um, but still might practice in um, behaviors that would put them at risk for other STIs. So um, screening for syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, HIV, um, maybe HPV. There's some debate about this idea of an anal pap, and there's a couple of providers who see mostly gay men in the Seattle community that do these um, anal paps to, to check for um, cancer. Um, I think there's some more research being done right now. But So if somebody doesn't identify as gay by um, man but still might 
be appropriate to screen them for these STIs. Uh, and then vaccinating for Hep A and Hep B, um, also because Hep B is transmitted the same way that HIV is. Um, and Hep A, there might be some more risk of the fecal oral route um, with sexual practices. Um, so it might be a good thing to check in on the vaccination there. Um, and then some health concerns pertinent for um, elders who are lesbian or bisexual women. And again, the, the labeling issue might also be pertinent for them as well. So not everybody identifies as lesbian or bi who, um, who engages in uh, same-sex sex. sex. Um, so lesbian and bi women are less likely to receive preventive services. Um, they need PAPs and mammography just like heterosexual women do. Um, often they are entering the healthcare system late, receive fewer health services, receive inappropriate care, and are disproportionately obese um, or smoke. And some of the reasons that screenings are not happening in terms of PAP and mammography, so often PAP and mammography go together for an annual screening uh, for folks. Um, and oftentimes women who identify as a lesbian or bi have been told that they don't need a PAP, um, that they're not at risk because then they're not partnered with men. Um, and certainly if you're partnering with men, obviously the risk has, is, is increased. Um, but the same guidelines by ACOG should be followed for lesbian and bi women as they are for straight women or heterosexual women. Um, uh, interestingly enough, though, 70% of women who identify as lesbian or bi have had sex with men at some point. Um, so that they might actually have active partner uh, who's their sig most significant other, um, but still have sex with men on occasion or be in different relationships um, at different times. There's definitely less of a risk of STIs, um, not sort of the same risk that's typically been associated with um, you know, when you're having sex more with men. Um, but one of the, the rates that have been higher is bacterial vaginosis. And that's not necessarily to say that it's an STI, um, but that it just seems to be more prevalent in women who have sex with women or lesbian and, and bi women. Um, one of the researchers who's done a lot of work on this is actually Dr. Jeannie Marazzo, and she's um, at the University of Washington School of Medicine um, and does a lot of work in infectious disease uh, focused on uh, gay and lesbian women, or excuse me, lesbian and bi women. Um, so still at risk for HPV, um, Canada, and TRIC. Um, and again, very little research for transgender folks, so not a lot of specific recommendations. Um, there are guidelines to follow um, WPATH, uh, which is the World Professional uh, Association for Transgender Health, is an interdisciplinary organization um, and they have historically written the guidelines for how to approach um, medical and surgical transition for transgender folks. It used to be called the Harry Benjamin International Standards of Care. Um, and so this is made up of you know, MDs, nurses, psychologists, pharmacists, um, some pediatricians as well. Um, and they have some nice guidelines to help people guide a transition. So you might have somebody show up at your practice um, who is interested in, in transitioning, and that is sort of the, the go-to document. The other go-to document has been made by the Vancouver Health Services, so um, I like that. I think it's a little bit um, more user-friendly in some instances if you need a quicker reference. Um, and so the thing to just kind of take away from if you're working with somebody who is starting a transition or you have inherited somebody who started to transition before seeing you is that there are, there are no sort of rigid, hard and fast rules to approaching the transition. It needs to be somewhat individualized um, based on that uh, person that you're seeing before you, what's worked before, if they're coming with other care. Um, the, the approach is to do uh, an informed consent, especially if you're starting somebody newly on hormones. So making sure they understand the risks and benefits of those hormones. Um, that you're screening for other uh, health care problems. So, for example, somebody moving from the female to male um, who would identify as a transgender man is going to probably inherit a little bit more higher, um, 
heart disease risk because of the testosterone that they're going to be taking. So uh, might need to scrutinize you know, blood pressure and lipids and things like that a little bit more. The other thing to note with um, female to males taking testosterone is that um, their, their hematocrits go up. So those need to be things that are monitored. So those are a couple of pearls there. Um, and in general, when you're thinking about that holistic care, um, don't necessarily go by the gender presentation you're seeing in front of you. You want to go by the anatomy that somebody still has. So for example, a female to male um, transgender person who still has a uterus um, needs to have PAPs done. Um, I would use the same guidelines that ACOG does for somebody who hasn't transitioned. Um, and FTMs can partner both with men, women, other transgender people. So again, the STI risk there, thinking about who people are partnering with, um, what kind of prevention that they're doing or not doing. Um, and then for uh, a couple of pearls for trans women, um, some of them are really accessing their hormones on, on the internet. They're trying to get things from like Australia or other countries that don't necessarily have um, the, the safety uh, guidelines in place to kind of prevent harm. Um, so I had a, another patient who recently came to me who was on like six milligrams of estrogen a day um, for the last two to three years. Um, and her prolactin was actually through the roof. Um, so that's something that you want to make sure that you're getting labs on for that. And the, the guidelines here can help kind of guide that. Um, but basically to, again, you know, do no harm, have that informed consent model, have it be a conversation. Um, it's not a requirement for people to see a psychotherapist before they start a transition. Um, people might have other mental health issues that are going on, but oftentimes those mental health issues like depression and anxiety end up getting relieved when they are able to start their transition or have their surgical or medical transition supported in a, a medical setting. Um, and I know that one of our participants in the audience today works in the jail system, and I know that sometimes that's a, a big deal for um, people who are incarcerated um, and are being refused their, their hormones and what distress that that causes them, what physical changes can happen because of that, um, and that they are inherently more at risk for violence and harassment, sexual assault in the jail system. So I know I've said a lot of sort of doom and gloom here, but there are actually some good things and they've shown up in the data, um, some assets that uh, LGBT elders can take away. Um, they are actually overwhelmingly physically active, um, somewhat more so than the, the general population of elders. Um, most of them are proud to identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Um, many are accessing LGBT centers um, in their communities if those are available, so finding other ways to connect with people and, and break that isolation that people can feel. Um, and there are improvements in legal rights. Um, so marriage equality is one right that has been um, big for a lot of people because of the, the sort of economic impact that that has. Uh, one example of that is Social Security um, benefits and rights after a spouse dies. LGBT people have historically been denied these benefits when their significant other dies because they have not, allowed, have not been allowed to be legally married. And so you know that can be hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars over um, the rest of somebody's lifetime. And as we are obviously an increasingly um, aging population, um, people are living longer and, and need sort of that economic support to be able to, to do, to live their lives. Um, some specific uh, needs to elder health are um, having senior housing that is welcoming and affirming. So um, this could be assisted living, this could be individualized apartments that might be more focused on LGBT elders, um, long-term care facilities. There's um, a little bit of a movement a while ago in Seattle and a few other major cities that wanted to build, do some fundraising and build housing that was specific to LGBT elders um, because people were getting refused access to assisted living or long-term care. Um, and I think that's a great idea, but I feel that that's more of a, a Band-Aid solution and doesn't really address that people should be able to go wherever they want to and not have to have a special place to go. They should be able to access um, long-term care, assisted living without fear that they're going to be mistreated or refused 
Um, they should be able to live their lives openly and, and freely in, in any kind of environment wherever they happen to live. Um, we need more legal services um, and people who are able to represent the needs uh, of LGBT elders. More social events, so again, historically, that bar situation um, where folks meeting each other, are they able to go to just your average mainstream um, senior center and, and find something that might be uh, interesting or welcoming or find, see other people like themselves or meet other people like themselves? Um, and one of the biggest things is supporting and, and training staff in hospitals, long-term care, assisted living, um, other skilled nursing facility, so facilities, clinics, jails, um, you name it. So um, I think it's fantastic that we're able to do an event like this today. Um, interestingly, the Affordable Care Act had this little, um, not I would say maybe not widely known part of it, that actually includes funding for cultural competency training. Um, and that was there was actually a specific line in there on LGBT um, cultural competency. Uh, I think we still have yet to see how this gets played out and, and who gets the funding and who gets that access. But um, you know, I think it would be fantastic if more schools of nursing and medicine, social work, uh, pharmacy had access to those kinds of funds. Um, another brain teaser. Which is true of LGBT persons? Uh, a, fewer have health insurance. B, um, LGBT people are less likely to receive health screenings. C, uh, they have higher use of alcohol and other substances. D, higher rates of depression su and suicide attempts. Uh, and E, highest rates of tobacco use. Um, so I'm guessing probably most of you have guessed by now that um, sadly all of the above are true. Uh, so we, we don't have a shortage of work to do um, and ways that we can kind of help deal with that. So factors related to that, we've talked about stress, uh, probably a disproportionate amount of stress, fewer clinicians available to serve the community, um, or at least fewer clinicians known. Um, to community members who can support that. Um, the delay and avoidance of healthcare services plays a part in that, and harassment and violence. Um, other considerations for LGBT folks, it's going to be the same thing for folks who don't identify as LGBT. So we still need to talk about cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease. Um, what are the family risk factors? What are the personal risk factors? Um, hyperlipidemia, diabetes. Uh, you know, could be argued because the higher rates of obesity, specifically um, in lesbian and bi women, are much higher than the general population. We're going to see higher rates of diabetes in some of our lesbian and bisexual women elders. Um, osteoporosis and doing appropriate screenings there. Always, always, always asking um, about depression and, and, you know, checking in on mood. I would say on every visit. How are you feeling? How's your mood today? Are you feeling blue? Um, any thoughts of hurting yourself? Um, these need to just be part of, I think, our comfort level with any any patient patient who walks in, but maybe a little bit of hypervigilance when you think you might have a, an LGBT person in front of you, and especially if something else isn't adding up and there aren't any other physical things that are coming up on exam. Um, and dementia, and, and I, mean, I think this one comes up for anybody who um, this is a struggle for anybody who's not even LGB or T and a struggle for families to deal with, but um, and folks who might not have um, their own children or their, their family might be people who are chosen family and might be aging themselves, um, what are their options for, for long-term care and, and who's supporting them through a dementia diagnosis? Um, let's remember sexual health. So. Um, over half of those 65 to 74 are still sexually active, and more than 25% of our um, older, older elders, 75 to 85 years old, are sexually active. So um, it's still important to screen these folks for STIs, as we've said, but then talking about you know, how are folks protecting themselves if, they're, uh, if they have a new partner, if they're having more than one partner, um, and just having a, a comfort and an ease with asking these questions. Um, you know, checking in with um, sexual dis about sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, um, especially in men, how does that, that play a part? Um, 
that might be a little bit more important in, in sort of a community that has been a little over hypersexualized. Um, there's there was one statistic that I, I came across um, that looked at um, gay men's health and their sort of perception of their own health, and they said that once you hit age 39, you're old. That was the, the overall perception. So. Remember this idea of youth and sex going hand in hand is um, still really important for gay and bi men, maybe more so than straight men. Um, what are LGBT concerns around aging? Um, so what's most on their minds? Discrimination in healthcare, housing, and long-term care, risk of heart disease, uh, complications from diabetes, um, health insurance or access to health insurance, or lack of support from friends. Uh, and this is uh, another data point. It's A, discrimination in healthcare, housing, and long term uh, care settings. Uh, I think we have time for another case. So, this is Mercedes. Um, she is 75 years old and she is transgender. So, again, as a transgender woman, that means born uh, male and has trans transitioned to female. Um, had a recent fall. It was diagnosed with Parkinson's um, a few years ago, and it seems to be progressing. And she's been trying to get into an assisted living facility. Uh, she's been refused at most places, saying that they're unable to accommodate somebody like her um, or in her situation. And so what do we need to think about in terms of how to kind of help and support her? Um, She's been refused to a lot of different places. What other resources can providers um, get to kind of help support her? Um, does she have any family of origin that she's connected to? Is she partnered? Does she have friends um, who might be able to help support this? Um, are her meds appropriate? Is she being followed by any other folks in specialty care? Um, is she being treated well when she goes to see those other specialists? So. A lot of times, especially for transgender folks, they might find that one great person in primary care, or they might find that one awesome therapist to kind of support them. Um, but then in terms of navigating other parts of the system or getting into assisted living, that's where things start to fall apart. Um, and there's a great movie documentary, gosh, now the name of it is escaping me, but um, it was done out of some folks in Boston kind of affiliated with um, Fenway, I think the Fenway Institute supported it, specifically looking at um, a couple of different folks in part in uh, couples uh, as they were aging, and I think one uh, one partner had Parkinson's um, and was starting to rapidly deteriorate. And um, just the following that couple about one person as being the, the caretaker and the struggles that were going on with that while while they were denied access to uh, assisted living. Um, so some of the other data um, shows that a lot of trans folks are um, experiencing disrespect, mistreatment, some being told that they have to go back into the closet or um, just not be able to live in their, their current facility. Um, so LGBT elders in particular don't trust these facilities and, and might be even more resistant to trying to go into them even if they really they do need some additional support. Um, and there's a, a lot of talk about fear of having to, to hide after so many years of kind of coming out of so many other struggles and, and adversity about being forced back into the closet while you're in your, your last few years of living. Um, some other resources that are useful, Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. Um, they have great uh, resources on their website, and they do an annual conference that changes different cities, usually in every September, October. Um, the World Professional Organization for Transgender Health that I mentioned earlier that has those guidelines to help um, folks transition, help providers work with transgender patients. Fenway Institute, um, again, for some more specific things around health resources, modules for training. Um, and then the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force has been an uh, advocacy uh, group for, uh, I think, around 25 years now. Um, they're national and they have local chapters, too. So I think that concludes the, the didactic here, and I think um, we can open it up for discussion and questions.
So we do have a question. What is the life expectancy of the LGBT community? I'm presuming they're wondering if it's different. Um, I don't think that there is any data available that specifically looked at that endpoint. Um, I have a feeling that the, probably the best person who would be doing that research would be Dr. Fredrickson Golden. So I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm happy to, to check on that and get back to you um, if I can find that out. I was also going to say if you find the um, name of that documentary and want to send it to mm -hmm. me, we can get that out to the sites for people who might be Great. interested. Great. So um, any mm -hmm. comments on domestic violence? And I'm not sure if they mean within the LGBT community mm -hmm. or towards the LGBT community. OK. Um, well, I can definitely address it within. Um, so there are definitely um, experiences of domestic violence within um, LGBT community. Um, and there are resources, at least in Seattle. There's a great organization that has a good website that anybody can access um, called the Northwest Network. And they do um, trainings and they do community building. Um, it's definitely something that's not very talked about. Um, and I think a lot of people think that it doesn't happen in the LGBT community. I can't speak to any data that specifically compares that to sort of the general population if there's a disproportionality. Um, but you know, I think in some ways people, I would say anecdotally, probably feel a little bit more isolated um, when those things come up. Um, and it's probably harder to access resources. Um, I'm from an area of um, upstate New York that has, um, I think, actually one of the oldest DV um, advocacy groups in the country. And um, I'm happy to say that actually one of my best friends growing up is the new executive director there. And um, they're doing some training to make their shelter and staff more kind of accountable and be able to address the needs of LGBT folks who are in DV situations. But I think some of the, the problem um, kind of comes up when, um, let's say, two men are in a relationship and one of them is experiencing domestic violence. Historically, shelters have been for women. Um, so it's, it's hard for men to be able to get away if they're trying to get away from um, an abusive partner. I think some of the other barriers are that um, it might be less manly to admit that you are in a domestic violence situation as a man. And how can, how can you get away from that? How you can get support from that? Um, Similarly, I think transgender folks have that um, experience too, or one, they're going to be possibly outed to the refused access to shelters. Um, and you know, three, I think, just have less support in general. So some other things to just think about. Um, that's a great other thing, to, if it's something that you screen for, um, to think about that with folks in same-sex relationships or trans folks too. Um, what are the differences? Um, regarding pharmacokinetics of HIV meds in the elderly? Do you know? I am not. I'm, I, I can't address that question. I'm not um, uh, an expert in HIV. I don't manage any folks with HIV right now. Um, I'm in primary care. Um, so I would have to defer that to someone else. Um, is there any research on elderly gay men who mask or closet by coming on physically to elderly women? I, I, I don't know. I've, I've not heard of that. Um, again, I would, if, if you have access to um, any PubMed or CINAHL searches, um, I would say Dr. Fredrickson Golden is probably one of the only people who come close to looking at it, so, um, or at least has the funding to, to look at it. Um, Dibble is another researcher who might be somebody who's looked into that, so, um, no, I haven't actually heard of that either. Does this population have more medical problems? Um, in terms of stress and anxiety, um, and in some cases, uh, higher rates, um, it kind of ebbs and flows in terms of um, STIs like syphilis and gonorrhea, chlamydia. Um, but in terms of cardiovascular disease or diabetes or lung or colon cancer, I don't think we know, or breast cancer. Um, there is data that shows because lesbian and bisexual women have um, historically less uh, frequent screening in terms of mammography that things are found later, um, or so when disease might be more advanced, and that they do have more complex um, health needs because the, in general as a community we access health services later. In case number one, would you advocate separating the escort from the patient to allow the patient to answer for himself? Mm -hmm. 
You know, I think that you have to kind of pick up on other cues. If I, I think if I personally got the sense that this was somebody who was maybe really domineering, or maybe there was a DV situation that was, you know, happening at that particular point in time, I, I might use the opportunity, okay, now we're going to do a physical exam. I usually, you know, like to give some privacy for that, so give, give that as the opportunity to step out and then ask some other screening questions. Um, you know, I don't know if it's it's wrong to, but I usually kind of trust my, my gut and kind of go with some of those questions in that sense. Um, if it's more the you know, more the person is so depressed or anxious, um, hard to be there, or is worried how you're going to react because the partner's there, maybe the partner's a little bit more comfortable um, in speaking, I would just try and find ways to have open-ended questions to uh, engage both of them, but, you know, maybe address some more questions specifically by making eye contact with that person or using that person's name. Vincent, what is your perception of, of your health today? Or Vincent, what is your biggest health concern today? Um, you know, why did you come or how can I help you, Vincent? You know, bringing it back to that person in that situation. I was going to say, um, you brought up the Affordable Care Act and I can tell you one way that it's being handled because I'm involved in a couple of different um, HRSA grants, Health Resources and Services Administration, which funds this program. Oh, great. Um, and they sent calls out to all of us asking us to identify and, um, you know, point to the um, LGBT kinds of educational programs and hmm. um, opportunities that we've created within our funding. So I think what they're doing right now is sort of a, you know, a, a, an assessment of what's out there now and then to determine what her needs. What the needs are. That's mm -hmm. great. Oh, that makes me really happy to hear that. Well, your name came up. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we claimed it. Oh, yeah, we've got this. <laughs> um, so any, any other questions here? It looks like I'm not seeing a lot more written questions come in. Any questions here in Seattle? Do you have um, a sense of, um, for um, an older LGBT person, um, how they might approach um, transitioning to some sort of long-term care to be able to um, think about what would be a safe environment for them? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think some of the questions can be are, um, you know, if you're talking to an intake person or an administrator there, um, specifically asking, have your staff been trained on this? Are, you, are there other clients that you know of who live here who openly identify or are out? Um, or are there, you know, what opportunities are there in this area that you know, this facility is involved with. Um, looking at looking things like that, um, I think, are first steps. Um, connecting with other people in the community, somebody else might have already gone through that, that process. So sometimes there's um, LGBT centers in an area, again, these tend to be bigger cities, I realize, so might not be as relevant for um, small town or rural settings. Um, but chances are, at least in larger areas that somebody's gone through that process before and if there's, um, if there's something either online. Um, I think also, I think the, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force would probably be a resource for that in terms of, um, because they have usually uh, spread out, they're spread out geographically in the country, so mm -hmm. are touched on to different parts. Um, can, if there are any, um, you know, elder advocacy groups in your area, do they have people who are part of those groups who uh, identify as LGB or T, or could they be a resource? So I, I think that, that there, you know, for better or for worse, there is a bit of mainstreaming that's happened with um, gay community and to a lesser degree transgender community. I think the good part of that is that um, things are becoming more transparent and resources are becoming more available and more mainstream entities are realizing that they actually have to um, answer to these communities. Um, I think a lot of times the motivation ends up being a little bit more of an economic one. They realize that actually there's money to be made from the community, but um, you know, I, I, things are things are progressing. So that, those would be some first steps that I would offer. Okay. 
How would a female to male patient, I guess, maybe get a pap? Maybe? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. They're asking get a pap. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> we'd give you, okay. Um, so, if an, a female to male has not had surgery to remove cervix, um, they still need to have uh, the pap test for cervical cancer. I think the, the barrier tends to be that a lot of F to M's don't want to go and get screened for that because showing up for a pelvic and pap is um, generally not a really great experience. Um, have either just been treated really badly um, or there might be a bit of a disassociation from that part of um, their bodies and they don't want to be reminded of that by being in stirrups and having a complete stranger look at those body parts. Um, so um, just explaining to people that a pap is still necessary. Um, and if those folks are having sex with men and a lot of F to M's identify as gay men, identify as bi men, um, and are having sex with biological men, then they also need to be screened for STIs. Um, and you know, might have historically maybe not even had sex with men until after they transitioned. So there's a huge variety and spectrum. Um, but it, basically, that's what I mean by if the anatomy is there, that's what you need to screen for. Mm -hmm. So you, need, you can't assume because a man has walked into your office um, that he doesn't have um, ovaries and a uterus and a cervix. Um, he might even still have um, uh, maybe not a chest reconstruction, and so perhaps would also need mammography um, and, and do that kind of breast screening. And even if they have had uh, chest reconstruction, it's not like a mastectomy that's done for breast cancer. So there's still breast tissue there. The risk probably goes down if there's, say, a pertinent family history for breast cancer. Um, but those discussions at least need to take place. And your job, I think, as the provider is to, sh to ensure that you can create the safe environment. Um, you know, talk through the exam, I think, is maybe even more important with trans folks. Like, OK, now you're going to feel my hand. Now this is the speculum. This is what I feel. This is what I see. Things look normal, or I, have, I see something here I'm concerned about, and just really talking through that process, um, and maybe allowing them to have somebody in the exam room with them, even if you maybe historically like, oh, the room's too small. We can't fit enough people in here. Um, anything you can do to reassure that person to make sure that they get that screening and, and just take away those barriers. So I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I was thinking. Um, you might be more likely to see them in a general primary care practice than in a gynecologist's office, yeah. for example. Yeah, that's true. Um, however, though, if, if folks do end up having some pathology and need to go see OBGYN, mm -hmm. you can imagine how uncomfortable it might be to be the guy in the OBGYN office. Like, mm -hmm. why would you be here? And mm -hmm. you know, are, are those folks, are those front desk people trained, are the medical assistants trained, are the nurses trained? Um, Again, I think we, we have a few select folks here who are providers in, in Seattle, um, but generally I don't think that's very widespread. Um, my experience is that we under-test for STIs with oral cancer. Mm. Um, you know, I guess that's cancer in all patients. Is this just as true for LGBT? Um, I think so. I think so. And I, you know, it's sort of a question on um, how much risk oral sex has for pharyngeal cancer. Um, I can't quote this for certain, but I feel like I did see data that showed that the rate of pharyngeal cancer has stayed almost flat, despite the fact that our smoking rates have started to go down and our tobacco use in general has gone down. So um, I think that's a great question. Uh, it's something I would screen for. And especially, um, you know, not even thinking about oral cancer too, but just if you have some sort of throat infection that's not healing and you're not seeing strep and it's been too long to be something viral, um, can we think about uh, pharyngeal um, gonorrhea or chlamydia and, mm -hmm. and make sure to, to culture for that. So they're oh, clarifying that, let me call oh. I always know of CX as Fantastic. Cervix, so. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking too. Great. Thanks. Um, is there an increase in cancer for trans patients getting hormones? So far, um, the data that's been done, and again, it's need a lot more, but the data that's been shown is that there's no increased risk for any cancer, as far as we know. Um, but again, the, the N in the population size is fairly small. 
Um, so the the idea is that in some places, if the or the, some thoughts are that if even if the risk of certain cancers increased, that maybe that wouldn't be a reason not to give those folks hormones, mm -hmm. um, because the distress of not transitioning is so high. Um, probably the risk of suicide would probably be higher than the risk of cancer at that point. Um, so kind of thinking about the mental health component of that. Um, and as far, you know, as, uh, as, let's say, cervical or vaginal changes in female to males who are getting exposed to exogenous testosterone, it does cause some vaginal atrophy, um, which basically kind of puts female to males in more of a, a menopause, uh, almost, mm -hmm. if you will, because menstruation stops if they're taking testosterone. Um, they're going to have less estrogen, obviously, in their vagina, mm -hmm. so um, less lubrication can be a risk. So thinking about maybe, you know, if they're having atrophy, um, prescribing um, vaginal estrogen. And that can be a really abhorrent thought to a lot of trans men. Like, I just wanted to get rid of all my estrogen. I don't want to think about putting more in. But it's much better because obviously it's more localized versus systemic. Um, it, you know, it's going to decrease that atrophy. It might make them less risk of having tears during sex, so less risk of infections and STIs and things like that. And might make sex just more pleasurable in general. So um, definitely a conversation to have, but also something to, to think about in terms of when you do an exam that it, it might be more um, like a menopausal vagina, so just making sure of comfort in, in that situation. Okay, well, I think we've done it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Great to be here today. It's so helpful to have these issues. You know, like there's there's things that you brought up. Like, oh, gosh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thing I'm most aware of is how mm -hmm. um, people who have been out sometimes have to go back into the closet when they go into long term care. Yeah. The name of that movie is gonna I know it's gonna come to me. <laughs> well just let me know and we'll send it out. Okay. So you got your parking thing, right? I did, thank you. Um, the, uh, As a former student, it's really nice having one of those, isn't it? <laughs> it is, although I'm on my motorcycle, so oh. I, I used to sometimes come in on my motorcycle, so it's not as expensive as, uh, uh -huh. as you know, a car. But uh -huh. It was definitely helpful today because I got out of clinic really late, and, like, and I have to take the ferry because I work on Bay Bridge. Oh, my gosh. So I was like, oh, God, don't let me be late. I was talking to Emily Hilderman the other day. And oh, yeah? She was talking about how, um, you know, it's really a learning experience to, to realize that even if you sort of schedule your clinic day to be done at a certain time, you know, because you've got some other commitment, then you've got people coming in at the last minute with all kinds of crazy things and charting to do. And <laughs> yeah, it's, that has been a huge thing. Yeah. For sure. Um, yeah, I was supposed to be done today at noon, and then of course I had this weird abdominal pain that showed up at eleven thirty. <laughs> no, so I was with him until one. So, wow. And then uh, we have I'm I'm one of two people who actually works full time as a provider. So mm -hmm. on any given day, we have like one and a half to three point five FTE out of the clinic, mm -hmm. and so we have to cover for them. So wow. it's like finishing answering all of their emails and all of their paperwork. And so are you working with another nurse practitioner or with a physician? It's There's like 13 providers. Oh, OK. So there's, it's mostly physicians. And there's two other nurse practitioners. And I think we're just about ready to hire another. Uh -huh.